Hi, and welcome to another episode of Woman Rediscovered Journey Through the Bible. My name is Akosia O. King, and as always, we are here to learn some biblical truths about God's Word and how we can apply it to our lives as women in Christ. Today, our journey is taking us to the book of 1 Samuel, the chapter number 22, and we are learning about David the disaster that occurred as a result of Doak, the Edomite. You might want to grab your pen, your Bible, and a writing pad for some great lessons today. So just to refresh our minds on what we learned in 1 Samuel, the chapter number 21, we learned about David fleeing to the town of Nob, where he met Ahimelech, the priest, who helped David um, as he was on the run from Saul. Now, we do learn here that Ahimelech assisted David by providing him with some food, which was the consecrated bread, and also with the sword of Goliath. Um, not only that, we also learned that Doek, the Edomite, was present when all of this is happening. And we are transferring that knowledge into our study in 1 Samuel, the chapter number 22. Now, before we dive into today's lesson, I just want to ask you, have you been in a place where life becomes so overwhelming and you just want to hide? For many of us as women in Christ, we are trying to hide either from our emotions, from people that may be hurting us emotionally, physically, psychologically, or we're just trying to hide from a trial that we are currently going through or perhaps from the past. Regardless of what we're trying to hide from, we find our friend David in a place where he is on the run and he needs a place to hide. Typically, we view our hiding places as a place of safety, a place where we can refresh our souls, gain some new strengths to enable us to move beyond our, our current circumstance. But we need to be very mindful where it is that we hide in our times of trial. The opening of 1 Samuel 22 tells us that David had escaped to the cave of Adullam. Now, the word Adullam basically translates a hiding place, a hiding place. And for each and every one of us, we do have a hiding place. Um, for many women, our hiding place can be behind the phone <laughs> where we pick off our, our cell phones and call people that we think may be able to assist us in our time of trouble. Many of us hide um, behind emotions that are not authentic. You know, when we are going through very dark moments, we put on this facade um, to let everyone know that we are fine, everything is fabulous and amazing. Now, we see here that David went to the cave of Adullam. And the reason David goes into this cave is not necessarily indicated in Scripture. But we do know that in this cave, God is about to give David an encounter. How do I know this? When you read the chapter number 22, the verse number 2, it says that, and all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him. About 400 men were with him. Some theologians believe that 30 chiefs were also moved um, from Israel and came to join David in this cave of Adullam. Now, why is this an encounter and why is it so significant? Many times when we are going through our dark, painful moments in life, the last thing we need is for other people to want to depend on us, right? In our minds, we think we are in such a terrible place that we just want to be left alone. We see here that David, who is being sought after by Saul so he could kill him, 
is not only in distress, but God brings other people who are in distress to him. Now, many times, this is not what we want to experience, right? We just want God to take our distress away and to free us from what we're going through. But I want us to be aware that God can even use your distress as a way to impact other people's lives. Yes, David was in distress, but that didn't stop God from still positioning him as the leader, the man that he had called him to be to impact other people's lives. So for my friends out there, who are currently in a season of distress where all you need is just to be left alone and for things to just calm down, I want you to understand that even in the midst of your mess, God can create access to other people or God can bring other people into your life who he wants for you to impact even in your distress and even in your brokenness. Now, we go on to see that David, as he was hiding in this cave of Adullam, goes to the king of Moab in the chapter in the chapter number 22, the verse number 3. And it says that from there, David went to Mitzvah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and my mother come stay with you until I learn what the Lord would do for me? Now, this particular verse tells me that as David was in his Adullam, he wasn't just there just sitting idle, but he was actively waiting to hear the voice of God. Now, the the key that we need to pick up as women in Christ is that the hiding place that we choose in our times of distress, in our times of sorrow, should be a place that grants us direct access to God and direct access to hear the voice of God. See, that is why nagging to every person who is willing to hear doesn't solve it. You know, you need to find a place where you can create a direct channel to heaven so that God can provide you with clear directions and instructions as to what he is looking for you to do in that season of your life. And so David was in Adullam, his hiding place, and he was waiting to hear from God and to hear what God wanted to do for him. And the Bible says in the verse number five, but the prophet, the prophet guard said to David, do not stay in the stronghold in Adullam, go into the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of Hera. Now, A key lesson we can pick here is that as David was waiting to hear the voice of God, he actually did hear him. God sent the prophet God to come to David with a clear, direct word from him that will transform David's life. And it was a word of instruction for him to move from Adullam into the land of Judah. You need and I need as women in Christ to make a resolution that we will not move until we hear the clear voice of God concerning the matter. Now, why is this important? You know, in our times of distress and in our times of trial, emotions are all over the place. We have different voices speaking into our circumstance. We have different ideas going through our mind. And and sometimes life can get very blurry just because of the pain and the sorrow that we are going through. Options might seem incredibly plentiful. And the mistake you can make in your time of waiting or in your season of waiting to hear the voice of God is to not hear from him 
and make a human judgment and have to repeat that cycle again. And so we see here that as David hid in his Adullam moment, in his Adullam place, he was able to get clear instructions via the prophet God who came to tell him that now it is time. Arise and go into the land of Judah. So when we come to the verse number 6 all the way down to the verse number 23, we are now entering into a much more muddy situation. And I use the word muddy because um, this is not necessarily something that David might have expected. Now, we've learned in past episodes that David's story is unique because, yes, there was a prophecy concerning his life. And why don't we just do a quick recap, right, of what that prophecy looks like. So we do know um, that theologians believe that around 1025 BC, that was when David is anointed by Saul, right? And this is from our lesson in 1 Samuel, the chapter number 16. Now, around this time, theologians believe that David was about 10 to 13 years old when he was anointed. Now, around 1020 BC, when David was around 15 to 17, theologians believe that he defeated Goliath. So perhaps David at that time is thinking, wow, you know, the promise of God concerning my life seems to be coming to pass, right? Because not only was I told that I was going to lead the people of Israel, but now God has given me this great victory over Goliath. So I'm thinking in David's mind, things were looking very great. Things were looking upward for him. Um, But we learned very quickly that right after this victory that David gained over Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17, Saul then develops this anger, this rage, this jealousy, and decides that he is going to banish David from his court. And later on, we see that he is in pursuit of David's life okay so fast forward to where we stand right now we see that David theologians believe that is in his late 20s um somewhere around 26 27 years old when this particular incident occurred in 1st Samuel 22 now take 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 this you know mental um note with me right It's been a long time since the prophecy was released. David has gone through different, different stages. And and I'm pretty sure our our friend David is beginning to feel, God, when is this promise going to happen? More importantly, how many people are you going to just bring into this picture and, 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 you know, create things with. Because I've been through different stages. I was on the run. I went to Gath. I went to Nob. You brought all these people to me in Adullam that I'm supposed to lead. You told me to go to Judah. And now I'm in Judah. And then we see here from the verse number 6 coming downwards, the people are also going to be killed. On account of David. What do I mean by that? The Bible tells us that Saul heard that David was around the town of Nob. He heard this. Why? Because remember, in our prior study, Doric the Edomite was present. And so Doric the Edomite um, basically told on David. And Saul got so upset that Ahimelech had helped David as he was escaping. So the Bible says that Saul orders the Benjamites, who were the warrior tribe that Saul traveled with, to kill Ahimelech, the priest. Now, we want to just pause here and, and just take a moment to think about how low Saul has descended. Come on. You have moved from being disobedient to God, 
from being jealous, from God lifting his anointing off of your life, and now you would you would want to do the unthinkable. And what do I mean by the unthinkable? You want to kill the priest of God. You know, back in in, in prior um chapters, you know, in our study in in the book of um, Deuteronomy coming all the way down, we do learn that specific instructions were given regarding the priesthood, the, the tribe of the priest. Now, these were sacred people. These were people that were set apart to be a communication channel between God and mankind. And so for you to touch and proceed to kill a priest, you are literally despising God directly. And so the Benjamites who were with Saul refused to kill the priest Ahimelech. Now let's pause and have a very brief lesson on who Doeg the Edomite is and what lessons he can teach us so we can be on the lookout for the Doeg's in our lives. We'll be right back. Now, when we talk about Doeg the Edomite, who is he and why does the Bible choose to define this man by his nationality? Now, the Edomites were the descendants of Esau, the firstborn son of Isaac and the twin brother of Jacob right? Um, we know that in the womb, Esau and Jacob struggled together. And God told your mother, Rebecca, that there will be two nations in your womb. And these two nations, the older one will serve the younger one. And we can find this in the book of Genesis chapter 25, the verse number 23. Right. We also do know that as an adult, Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of red soup. Right. And he hated Jacob after this. We also do know that there was some tension between Jacob and Esau because Jacob ended up receiving the blessings from Isaac and Esau was not able to receive the blessings. And so when we talk about the Edomites, the Edomites um, in some theological accounts are known as the red people. And the red um, comes from the nature and the description, of course, of the land where they lived on, um, which is south of the Dead Sea. And so when we talk about the nation of Edom, Edom descended from Esau, and then Israel descended from Jacob. Now, historically, there was tension between the Israelites and the Edomites. We will see that King Saul fought against the Edomites, right? Um, in, in a war, David would also fight against the Edomites. And, and the Edomites had an established kingdom even before Israel started having the idea of having a king. Now, another thing that we also need to recognize is that the Edomites were not worshippers of God, the Lord God Almighty. The Edomites had um, religions that were similar to the pagan societies they were surrounded with. Some theologians believe that they worship fertility gods. And so the Edomites did not really understand or have any comprehension of the sacred nature of the Lord our God and the respect and fear that he deserved. So when we come to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 22, the question we need to ask ourselves is what will an Edomite be doing amongst the trusted counsel of Saul? Now, that's that's a question for me too. And it's very interesting because as women in Christ, <laughs> We have some Edomites around us. And when I use the word Edomites, I'm using the word in regards to people who have no similarities with us. Yes, we see that Esau's descendants were the Edomites. Jacob's descendants were the Israelites. However, there were no similarities. The Edomites worshipped idols. The Israelites worshipped God. Many times, you know, we, we pair ourselves with um, people who are not 
on the same page with us spiritually. People who do not see things the way we see them. People that are not fostering our growth in, in God. People that do not hold the same Christian values like we hold. Yes, the Bible says that we need to be in the world, but be not of the world, right? Um, which means that, yes, we need to surround ourselves with people so that we will positively impact them, but we should not allow them to negatively impact us. And so we see here that Doeg the Edomite, a foreigner, was part of Saul's trusted council. Now, in our study in 1 Samuel of chapter number 21, we saw that Doeg had been kept in the priest's house or in the presence of God. And theologians believe that it was because he was going through the process of converting into um, Judaism, into converting into the practices of the Israelites. So God had ordered for him to stay um, in his presence and so the, the, the priest Ahimelech could take him through the rituals that he needed to perform in order to be conformed into um, the nation of Israel, right? We know that the Israelites were circumcised, you know, they were set apart and all of those things. So some theologians believe that that was what kept him in the presence of God when David went to Ahimelech. So now we see here that even though he had spent some time in the presence of God, Doeg was still not transformed. <laughs> Why do I say this? I say this because when Saul gives the order for the priests, Ahimelech, to be killed. The Bible says that the Benjamites, who were Israelites, knew the gravity of the order that has been released. They knew the implication of raising the sword against God's chosen people. So the Benjamite refused. Now, there's a lot of very heavy stuff here. For you to refuse the order of a king, that is pretty heavy stuff, right? But they did this because they valued the things of God, the holy things of God over their human kin. You know, when we value the things of God, we treat the things of God with respect. We treat the things of God with dignity. Now, when we don't value them, we treat them with secular mentality. And we see that Saul was treating the priest with a secular mentality. Because for him to even think of killing a priest, that, that was far, that was deep, right? So we see here that Saul then commands um, Doeg to go and to kill Ahimelech. Now we need to be very careful when we read this chapter. And um, I'm going to read a little bit of the, the, the verses for us so we can get an idea um, of what the Bible is telling us here. Now, the Bible says that Saul said to him, and this is Saul speaking to Ahimelech, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, giving him bread and a sword and inquiring for him from God? Ahimelech answered the king, Who of all your servants is as loyal as David? The king's son-in-law, respected in your household, was it the first time that I inquired of God for him? Of course not. So we see here that Ahimelech doesn't see anything wrong or he doesn't see the sin that he had committed, right? And then, and then we see Saul say, You will surely die, Ahimelech. And you and your whole house shall die. And the verse number 17 says, then the king ordered the guards by his side, turn and kill the priest of the Lord. But they refused. <laughs> I love that. But they refused to strike the priest of the Lord. Then the king ordered Doeg, you, you should go and turn and strike the priest. Now listen to this very carefully. The verse number 18. So Doeg the Edomite, 
turned and struck them down. That day, he killed 85 men who wore the linen ephod. Now, we learned in our past episodes that the linen ephod represented the priesthood. So he killed 85 priests. Now, listen to this. He also put to the sword Noab, the town of the priest, with its men, women, children, infants, its cattle, its donkey, and its sheep. But Abithar, son of Ahimelech, escaped and told David all that had happened. Now, let's let's step back and analyze this. Saul just said, kill Ahimelech and his house. Doeg goes beyond the order. Not only does he kill Ahimelech and Ahimelech's house, he goes ahead and kills 84 other priests. Not only that, he kills the entire town, the women, the children, the sheep, the cattle, everything in it. See, Whenever we find ourselves associating with the Edomite spirit or the Edomite, which is the people who do not have anything in common with us spiritually, whenever we find ourselves in association with them, what ends up happening is this. It might start off as a little bit of a sin, right? Oh, it's just a priest, but it gradually expands into something more monstrous. You know, a friend of mine was sharing with me how, you know, she started hanging out with this person that will cuss every now and then. You know, by the time she realized she was cussing too, by the time she realized she was using full-blown profane words on a daily basis. And, and so when you entertain the Edomite spirit or the Edomite, you might give them just a little bit of room in your life by the time you realize they have taken control of everything remember the bible says that the enemy comes to steal to kill and to destroy he doesn't just come for the little minute opportunities we give him he comes to take over and we see that playing out exactly in the scripture in first samuel the chapter number 22 saul just said Kill Ahimelech and his house. But Doeg went on to not only kill Ahimelech and his house, he annihilated a whole town filled with women, children, their cattle, and everything. What a pity. What a shame. And so we see that Abithar, who was Ahimelech's son, escapes and he goes and he tells David, And I can only imagine the pain, the sorrow, the distress that David might have felt. All these innocent people lost their lives on my account. But see, the beauty about disasters is this. There's always the hand of God moving behind the scenes to shift and to move events for His glory. Romans 8.28 tells us that for we know that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And David, like you and I, are called according to God's purpose. And because of our love for him, situations would always work together for our good. What do I mean by this? Now, theologians believe that by Saul placing this order for Ahimelech to be killed, he was literally moving the priesthood from his reign into the hands of David. See, the priest served as a channel between the people of God and God. And as a priest, you are closely connected to whoever the king is of that era. You are the voice of the the, the, the Lord to the king. And so by Saul ordering for Ahimelech and the entire town 
of priests to be killed, he was cutting short his communication channel into the realms of God. His communication channel into the realms of the Spirit of the Lord. And by Abithar escaping this massacre and running to David, now God is bringing the priesthood. God is bringing the priest generation, the voice of a priest, the presence of himself into the camp of David. So we would see later on going on through the the, the remaining chapters that Saul was done. God was not going to be on his side anymore. And we will see a significant role that Abitha will play in the reign of David. It was beautiful. So beloved, today I'm encouraging you as a woman in Christ. There are three profound things we can learn from 1 Samuel, the chapter number 22. The first thing is for us to identify where our hiding place is in our times of distress. Where is your Adullam, your place of hiding? It is my prayer that we would always hide in God. We would always hide in the presence of God because in His will and in His presence, there is safety. The second lesson we can learn is that we do not need to move and make hasty decisions in our moments of crisis until we clearly hear the voice of God. Remember, as David was in Adullam, he was waiting on the voice of the Lord. And oh boy, oh boy, God did answer by sending the prophet God to come and to give him an instruction for him to move into the land of Judah. And the third and final lesson we learn in this particular chapter is to watch out for the Edomites that we harbor in our lives. Little did Saul know that when he gave the order for Ahimelech and his house to be killed, Doek was going to wipe away an entire town with its women and children. We need to be careful the extent to which we grant the enemy access into our life. It might start off as a small sin, but it can grow in a matter of days, minutes, seconds, years into something humongous that we cannot escape from. It is my prayer that we glean these three great wisdom points and that we transform the way we view our relationship with God through His authentic Word and the lives of the people that He presents to us through His Word. May the Lord be with you. Until next time, by way of this program, shalom and peace unto you. Bye-bye.